Revolution. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to remind them I have about 10 minutes for their opening remarks, followed by five minutes for responses, and then we'll move to audience Q&A. So our speakers, Anthony Montero, has a long history as an activist in the left, starting with the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Freedom Movement, and helped elect several black candidates. Montero is a scholar of W.E.B. Du Bois and the founder of the Saturday Free School for Philosophy and Black Liberation in Philadelphia. Spencer Leonard is a founding member of Platypus, a historian of South Asian and modern imperialism, and the editor of the forthcoming books, Marx and Engels, on Bonapartism, Selective Journalism, 1851-59, and on Imperialism, 1856-62. Dan Lazar is a journalist who writes regularly for The Weekly Worker in London, published by the Communist Party of Great Britain. He's also the author of The Frozen Republic, How the Constitution is Paralyzing Democracy, and two other books dealing with the Constitution as well. So with that, let's get started. I'll be turning it over to Anthony. <laughs> uh, this is a very challenging subject, and I wish to approach it in a uh, non-traditional way. I'm not a historian. Uh, in fact, I should say that uh, these days, I, I have a low opinion of most historians, uh, especially those who are trying to peddle the idea of settled colonialism, which I feel is uh, just another way of uh, reinscribing the color line uh, at a time uh, where we have the possibility of demolishing it. Uh, but my approach uh, will be uh, logical. In other words, I will be speaking about American history and the possibility of a fourth American revolution using W.E.B. Du Bois's work, Black Reconstruction in America. Uh, and I uh, view this work, or one of the ways that I view this work, and one of the ways I think it should be viewed, but is not viewed, and uh, I think the problem is that most people that write about this book are historians who are untrained in either logic, epistemology, uh, social theory, sociology, or anything but history. So. Uh, what they tend to do is uh, to discover uh, where Du Bois has made mistakes. Uh, none of them, and I'd like to underline, none of them uh, has done uh, with the work what Du Bois was doing. In other words, uh, take Eric Foner, and I know I'll get back to the point in a minute. Eric Foner's huge tome called Reconstruction, uh, published in the mid 80s, is essentially uh, a refutation of Du Bois. It is a work that upholds the idea that America is, was moving uh, increasingly towards the fulfillment of liberal democracy, bourgeois democracy. Uh, that is not what Du Bois was doing at all. Uh, Foner mentions Du Bois once in the uh, preface, but does not return to him or engages uh, the basic themes. Uh, the historian Gerald Horn recently had an essay in The Nation on black reconstruction, uh, without going through a lot of what he was saying, uh, the point of his essay was to say, in essence, that Du Bois's black reconstruction would have been a better work had it uh, explored settler colonialism. Uh, by the way, settler colonialism is a very vague 
notion, uh, uh, and even vaguer when one considers applying it to American history, uh, and so on. But Du Bois begins the work with the black worker, an enslaved proletariat, joining slavery and the proletariat was in many ways too much for many people to wrap their heads around. Enslavement uh, was the opposite of being proletarian. In other words, freeing Africans from slavery would have uh, introduced them into the proletariat. Whereas Du Bois is making the argument which is a logical argument, I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, that even as enslaved people, they were a proletariat. Du Bois pretty much argues that the proletariat in becoming was the enslaved proletariat, constituting a concrete universal. Let me put this another way, and this is why I think the work must be approached in the way that any serious Marxist would approach Das Capital, as first and primarily a work of logic. Black Reconstruction is first and foremost a work of logic. The principal category of the work is the black worker or the black proletariat. There is no work in American history or world history that begins there and logically develops a theory of American history that begins with the black proletariat. In other words, to understand American history and the class struggle in America, you must understand the black worker. Let me put it another way, and this I think is a Hegelian uh, construal. that the proletariat itself, in its becoming, is the black proletariat. Sounds like the most ironic thing to say. But Du Bois understands the possibility of American revolutionary change in this way as a process, as logically emerging from the being of the black proletariat. And that, here's, here's the thing that's so profoundly interesting to me. The class conflict and the American working class becoming a class for itself is tied up with its recognition of itself in its totality as
is becoming the black proletariat. I'll just end on this. I think this way of understanding American history from both the logical, and I think a logic of history is very important. That's, forgive me sometimes, I, I get a little bit combative. But you know, one of the reasons that I am so, uh, I get so um, I guess fed up, exhausted with, tired of uh, academic and professional historians is that they've abandoned any concept of logics of history, of historical processes. No notion of class. Uh, race, yes, because, and I'll you know, parenthetically say this, there seems to be, on the part of progressive social scientists and historians, a need in several states of the former slaveocracy. The book is about revolution, not abstract democracy. The strategic agent and category of the book is the black proletariat. It is that understanding that makes it possible to understand and fight for a revolutionary future. Not that it is guaranteed, but we have to have a way to think about it. And thus, the concept of a fourth American revolution coming out of the previous American revolution, which we generally call the Civil Rights Movement. I'll stop there, I think it was 10 minutes.
<laughs> Biden, after first acknowledging that he that Jefferson was a slaveholder, intoned over images of Jesse Owens, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King, that what Jefferson wrote has pulled us together for more than two centuries. Jefferson may have been an inexplicable hypocrite, uh, entirely unclear why uh, he was a revolutionary, um, but he had a way with words. Then Biden got to the point, as the images shifted to the violence of the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. If Donald Trump is reelected, it will forever fundamentally alter the character of this nation. If we give Donald Trump four more years, this will not be the country envisioned by Washington. This will not be the country bound together by Lincoln. This will not be the nation lifted up by Roosevelt or inspired by Kennedy. And then I love this phrase. This will not be the nation of Barack Obama. <laughs> and then he says even more bizarrely, truth bends towards justice and that's the end of the court. <laughs> um, MSNBC commentator Joe Scarborough remarked on this, that he had long felt it necessary to balance the heritage of the country against its shortcomings, so as to figure out a way to move forward using the words of the founders written on paper while moving past the horrors of slavery and of Jim Crow. Responding, Al Sharpton rehearsed the ad's progressive message, invoking the promise of America as articulated by the founders Lincoln and the Civil Rights Movement, Roosevelt and Kennedy, et cetera. Donald Trump, you will remember, likewise ran on the American Revolution. This was perhaps most evident in his Fourth of July speech delivered at Mount Rushmore. There he paid tribute to Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt, proclaiming, this monument will never be desecrated their achievements will never be forgotten, and Mount Rushmore will stand as an eternal tribute to our freedom. Trump declared the 4th of July to be the most important day in the history of nations, declaring the U.S. to be a revolution in government in the pursuit of justice, liberty, and prosperity. He argued that no people have done more to advance human progress than the citizens of our nation, zeroing in on the same words that Biden did, all men are created equal. Trump asserted that what God has given, we will allow no man to take away. The revolution he maintained represented the triumph of spirit, philosophy, and reason, marking the culmination of thousands of years of history. But Trump then went on, like Biden, to declare that the revolution was in danger, noting the destruction of statues, not only of Confederates, but of founding fathers and even abolitionists. Trump argued that the Democrats were targeting the very legacy of the revolution. Declaring the American people to be strong and proud, he averred that we will not allow our history and culture to be taken away from us, arguing that cancel culture is entirely alien to our values, Trump declared the assault on liberalism to be an attack on American liberty, throwing at the Democrats the same charge that they throw at him, Trump declared the woke mob to be promoting a new fascism, one that demands allegiance and submission, censorship, black blacklisting and persecution, he said, is designed to overthrow the American Revolution. When Biden took office, he declared the defense of democracy. So that was 2020. Uh, what since then? When Biden took office, he declared the defense of democracy to be the defining challenge of our time charging the Department of State to organize an international summit for democracy, 
in, 20, in December 2021, he announced leaders from 100 governments have announced a wide range of commitments and pledges in support of democratic renewal centered on the summit's three, three themes of strengthening democracy and defending it against authoritarianism, fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights. These include commitments to counter efforts to combat, counter efforts to combat is a direct quote, uh, I guess the State Department is an editor, sorry, <laughs> to combat disinformation, strengthen electoral integrity, promote, better promote the human rights of activists, women and girls, youth, LGBTQ plus persons, persons with disabilities and marginalized populations, address drivers of inequality and inequity, strengthen enforcement of financial disclosures by exploited by corrupt actors and invest in the development, use and governance of technology that advances democracy the international agenda of the United States, as defined by the election of 2020, is in short, now understood by its architects, to be an assertion globally of the defeat of Donald Trump. In remarks to the Greek ambassador on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of Greek independence, President Biden, after a ritual genuflection to the ancient Greek ideas that first taught us that we the people and the demos, our democracy, can control our destiny. Biden proceeded to note how the American Revolution helped to inspire not the French Revolution, but the Greek independence movement, just as it inspired the Bolivian movement in South America around the same time. Then Biden again sounded a notable law, democracy is in danger, made familiar from the election. Noting how democracy is more under assault today than, including in the United States, any time in the recent past, Biden then invoked Greek anti-fascism. During World War II, the Axis forces of fascism were sweeping across Europe. Greece said no inspiring the world through its existence. Greek national, self, Greek national self-determination and Greek anti-fascism. The parallels were just too beautiful for the party speechwriter to ignore. And so the conclusion follows. Today, the war and wisdom and the wanton disinformation, war and wisdom, the war and wanton disinformation and wanton disinformation have returned to Europe with Russia's brutal and unprovoked attack on its neighbor, Ukraine. Together, we're showing the power and the capacity of democracies to be able to act in unison. We're helping the Ukrainians to say no to Russian aggression. We're saying no to tyranny and to the idea that autocracy will outpace democracy in the 21st century. And of course, domestically as well, the watchwords of this administration are democracy and anti-fascism. And in the way of the American Revolution, thus defined, stands the Constitution. The threat of fascism is enabled by the Constitution. Whether it's the Electoral College, the Supreme Court, the First Amendment, and the threat of misinformation, the right to assemble and petition grievances, the right to due process of law, or the right to bear arms. The world must be made safe for, through democracy, for expertise, anti-fascism, and the empowerment of communities. In this respect, then, the Democratic Party is returning to its roots. This panel in 2022 recalls another set of historical panels that Platypus has hosted in recent years, those commemorating the revolution of 1917. At that time, Vladimir Lenin struggled with Woodrow Wilson for the soul of the American Revolution. Woodrow Wilson, it should be noted, opposed the US Constitution, viewing it as obsolete 
and arguing instead for the prerogatives of the fourth branch of government, the permanent bureaucracy, as bolstered by and expressing democracy. Wilson believed that a professional bureaucracy could be apolitical and apply professionalism and science to the running of the country's affairs. Even as he imprisoned Eugene V. Debs for opposing the First World War, Wilson fought in the name of the American Revolution for an international order of democratic peoples enjoying the right of national self-determination. To this progressive legacy, the Democrats today can join that of the Popular Front and the People's War against fascism. Just four years before his inauguration, speaking at the opening of the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, Biden had tied the Declaration of, the Independ of Independence to the U.S. Constitution and indeed to the French Revolution's Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. As he then said, the Constitution made our institution the Constitution made our institutions the guarantor of our inalienable rights. But the experience of the Trump presidency, Russia Gate, and the frantic attempt to impeach Trump for opposing foreign US foreign policy drove the Democratic Party from those commitments for good and all. It isn't just the legacy of white supremacy that's to be opposed, but the American Revolution to the extent that it bequeaths to the present a constitutional republic that constrains the democratic rights of the people, themselves conceived as so many ethnic, gender, and racial constituencies. As, Bu as Biden even fudged it, even in that speech, the revolutionary legacy amounts to the revolutionary notion of the consent of the government, now interpreted strictly as voting rights. How that consent is to be formed requires no elaboration, as people are conceived as pre-existing identity, <coughs> identi identity traits that simply find expression at the ballot box. The world is to be made safe for democracy to guarantee the right of the present to endure forever. Joe Biden resolved to run for president according to his own account as a result of the violence in Charlottesville in 2017. This, of course, conveniently overlooks the fact that Donald Trump's White House had no control whatsoever of the refusal of the police to enforce the law in Charlottesville, a matter entirely within the hands of a Democratic chief of police, mayor, and governor, Clinton lackey Terry McAuliffe. At the time, Trump remarked, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, but who's next? Washington, Jefferson. And indeed, it is significantly not just Confederate statues that have been attacked by Democrats, but statues of Washington, Jefferson, abolitionists, Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant. The struggle against fascism, in other words, does not align itself with the revolution, with the struggle against slavery, or the struggle for reconstruction, but with the Bonapartist state, with what Woodrow Wilson termed the fourth branch of government. All that the Democratic Party has to say when it unleashes its anti-fascist and anti-racist mobs is that the revolution taught us that, as H. Rap Brown put it, violence is as American as apple pie. As, as otherwise draconian coronavirus emergency restrictions are suspended to permit the torching of buildings and the smashing of storefronts, the people are goaded against the people. And the left stands back and smiles, chanting to itself, this is what democracy looks like. The lectures that Platypus organized via Zoom in 2020 address the history of revolution as it came to be expressed through democracy. Tracing the revolution from its beginnings, those lectures noted how Andrew Jackson founded the first American political party attempting to claim the mantle 
of Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republicans, showing how that political formation, the, the lecture showed how, in fact, that Jeffersonian political formation disavowed the appellation of party as illiberal, and instead up, upheld the defense of the revolution in the, Jefferson, in the election of Jefferson in 1800 against the threat to the revolution posed by the Federalists. The formation of the Republican Party in the wake of the international crisis of 1848 sought to reclaim the Jefferson legacy in the age of mass democracy more honestly, but eventually succumbed to the contradictions of liberal democracy. On the left, these contradictions were squarely posed by the attempt to prosecute a politics of social and political action under the Socialist Party of America of Eugene Debs in the face of a party political order gripped by progressive democratic capitalism. A democratic party that upholds middle class discontents in the face of the industrialization of, in the late 19th century, a democratic party upholding middle-class discontent in the face of the industrialization of the United States opposed the Republicans as the party of capital. Debs' socialists squarely opposed the capitalist democracy of William Jennings Bryant, even as it counterposed itself to the Republicans, arguing not for capital's leadership of democracy, but for the revolutionary appropriation of capital. With Wilson, and especially FDR, the Democratic Party has attempted to claim itself as the definitive legatee of the American Revolution. As what? As progressive Democrats. That the left today has subordinated itself to that progressive legacy, a legacy interpreted as democracy, bureaucracy, and imperialist war for national self-determination in opposition to the U.S. Constitution is significant. The American Revolution was a struggle, as Thomas Paine put it, to begin the world anew. That wasn't a one-time event, but as Jefferson averred, an ongoing enterprise to grow the tree of liberty. The U.S. Civil War represented a response to the crisis of history, represented by the stalling of the world historic indeed the crisis of the world historic struggle against feudalism and slavery, a struggle for a new birth of freedom that could, in the age of capital, only be propelled by democracy, by government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Since that time, the American Revolution has been caught within the contradictions of liberal democracy. Socialist politics understands that the prosecution of the task of democracy, the achievement of socialism, is the fulfillment of the cosmopolitan aspirations to international cooperation and world peace articulated in the 18th century, demands the achievement of a dictatorship of the proletariat. But to build the capacity to rule, the working class demands, above all, its rights free speech, assembly, the right to self-defense, to due process of law, to name a few. The left, today's left, has, in supporting democracy against the Constitution, aligned itself with progress, which under capitalism can only mean the reconstitution of the same old same. In the United States, but in, in British North America. 
the, uh, the, the, the slave proletariat was composed of indentured servants yeah. who were white, and that um, that uh, blacks formed a growing portion of this proletariat. But only toward 1700 was slavery fully racialized, so that slavery was defined as a as a, a black institution, and whites were therefore elevated above slavery. Um, so I'm not agree that the, the slaves were the initial proletariat because crops like uh, like um, tobacco, uh, uh, rice, etc., were farmed on a on a proto-industrial basis, mm -hmm. making them a, 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 a the, the first proletariat. And this was true in the West Indies as well, of course. Um, but uh, but the, the the slave proletariat uh, began. Uh, as a white group. And then only subsequently was it then uh, turned, you know, did it come a black institution. Uh, but anyway, um, and also uh, uh, Mr. Leonard, Spencer Leonard. Um, so I, I think that you, I think that what you're saying is that you regard the American Revolution as a democratic small phenomenon. As a liberal as well. A liberal. Uh, uh, I'm here to argue. So and with respect, yeah. you're taking up your presentation time. Yes, I'm not just removing that. Thank you. Sir. Here's my point. Uh, my view of the U.S. Cause, of the U.S. Revolution, American Revolution, is much more uh, uh, complex. Um, I would argue that the, that the revolution was the last expression of the ancien regime. The ancien regime, the regime uh, prior uh, to 17.
predominantly in favor of ancient privileges that had accrued to, to cities, guilds, etc., and they were opposed to interference by the Holy Roman Empire, Joseph II and Vienna. Um, so that was a very conservative concept of revolution as revolving back to some pristine uh, time in the past, um, and uh, rather than a, a great leap forward. And even in France, in 1788, popular sentiment was behind something called the, uh, the Parlement. It was not like the British Parliament. These were regional courts that were dominated by the, uh, by the aristocracy. bequeathed to us a, a constitution that while it did make certain concessions to modernity, modernity essentially sort in, ex in exchange for modernization sought to lock in place certain eternal you know uh, institutions of self-government 
no longer colonial uh, assemblies, but state governments. It sought to, to severely limit federal power. Uh, in fact, to the point where Americans really didn't know who had the ultimate power, which is why Americans wound up, fight, wound up fighting the Civil War. And it also wound up placing the Americans, the American people, the sans culottes of New England, behind the gentry, the Virginia gentry, composed of people like Madison, Washington, and Jefferson, slaveholders all, of course. And it locked slavery in place, surrounded it with legal guarantees that were actually stronger than anything that were seen, that were you know, anything uh, known under the British. And those guarantees proved to be so strong that essentially the slaveocracy federal government until the North finally erupted in the Revolutionary War, which to me was the American equivalent of the, of the, um, of the, uh, the Jacobin ratification, the Jacobin dictatorship that was imposed in 1798. Anyway, so that is my, that is my, my argument. America is the last ASEAN regime. America is a conservative democracy, a democracy that defines itself in conservative terms. Um, which is the, the source of this awesome, deep uh, conservatism we see in our society today, and which is locked into place by this increasingly undemocratic instrument known as the US Constitution, which is now in the hands of a obstreperous, oppressive, right-wing minority, uh, and, in the, and in, the, in the shape of the Supreme Court, <coughs> which is imposing, uh, and imposing against the will of the people and increasingly right-wing reactionary protests. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, first of all, uh, indentured servantry and chattel slavery are qualitatively distinct social phenomena. I think unless we understand that, we do not understand American history. Uh, moving uh, from indentured servantry to chattel slavery begins logically the formation of the American working class as we know it today. But uh, my point was, uh, I guess, several things. One, uh, I assume, I acknowledge that we're living in a moment of a profound ideological struggle. If there's anything that defines our moment more than Democrats versus Republicans, or we have to um, keep Trump out of office, is the fact of a heightened ideological moment. And a moment where, for anyone that um, uh, looks closely enough, one of the central issues is a democratic revolution uh, producing a radical democracy that could set the stage for a total transformation of the political economy of the nation. My argument was that this would constitute a fourth American revolution. Uh, that historiography that sees one American revolution and does not even acknowledge the Civil War and Reconstruction as a revolution, uh, albeit uh, a reversed and a great counter-revolution, as Du Bois says, a counter-revolution of property, um, uh, but not to see that period as a revolutionary period is a mistake, but then, not to understand the third American Revolution. And here, I think, is a great historical blindness of the left and progressives. They see the civil, what is called the Civil Rights Movement, what the participants call the Black Freedom Movement, as an attempt to uphold a liberal, democratic, constitutional regime. But it was far more than that. I think 
any study of Martin Luther King, who was the vanguard of a lot of this, uh, would lead you to understand that, uh, that what was being fought for was something far more profound than changing laws and giving black people the, the right to vote. What, in essence, was being fought for, and this is King's point, this is the point made by uh, those who came after that heightened period of the Civil Rights Movement, be they the Black Panther Party, uh, be they many others, was the question of the transformation of the American people and of the American nation creating, in essence, a new people and a new nation. That's all over Martin Luther King. I would suggest read him carefully, listen to him. Uh, the idea of a new people and a new nation, a new democracy dedicated to the well-being of the people, a new social contract, and an ending of the military-industrial complex. <coughs> defeated in battle. This is not unusual. Revolutionary movement, counter-revolution. Now, I, I, I would say, we're on the cusp of a fourth American revolution. Now, I, I'm not going to get in a narrow sectarian debate about what is a revolution. I think revolutions take on many forms. I think the American Revolution because of American history has unique characteristics. Let me, let me kind of end on this point because I, I don't know if I'm making it as strongly as I'd like to underline. The third American Revolution sought to remake the American nation and to remake the American people, the outcome of which is what James Baldwin said, could make America the last white nation. There is something in the logic of the class struggle in the United States which moves in that direction. That is why I was trying to make a logical argument that Du Bois starting with the black worker, the proletariat that had been enslaved. And here I think we're looking at something radically new in modern, perhaps in world history. That an enslaved proletariat is the proletariat in its becoming. Hence, making a logical argument, hence, as the proletariat becomes itself, it ceases to be white. As the proletariat ceases to be white, America moves to being the last white nation. A revolutionary achievement <clears throat> of world historic significance. I make these points, and I, I know I'm talking a little too much. I make these points because the opposite position is what we see proclaimed and announced in the loudest terms these days. That the majority of American workers are racist and fascist. That this was a situation from the beginning. That black workers and black people stand alone except for their being aligned with the woke capitalist, and hence, there is no revolutionary way out because the United States is a counter-revolutionary 
nation and the American people, especially white America, is a counter-revolutionary people. You know, just to express myself emotionally, I have never heard of anything so grotesque by people who claim to be radicals and revolutionaries. In fact, it is the left, not the Trump voters, ironically, who are reinscribing the color line for temporary political gain. But the logic of American history, I would argue, goes against them. And what we are witnessing, OK, how do we know this? I mean, OK, polling data, ethnographic studies, our own knowledge of our, of our people. And let's not forget, I'm talking too long. Very sometimes. OK, I'm sorry, man. Uh, these people that are being called Nazis and racists are our people. This is our working class. Our faith is with them. And so we must understand what they are aspiring to. The nation is less racist now than it was 60 years ago. It's not the end of the game. The nation is less pro-war than it was at the time of the Vietnam War protest. We start in a situation that advantages us. I'm sorry to have spoken too long. certificate 
of the imperialist state. That Woodrow Wilson is not incoherent in arguing for a permanent apolitical bureaucracy as the, the political expression or realization of democracy. Right? And that, that it, and that that is the overcoming or the rendering obsolete of the U.S. Constitution. Now, the revolution, if you don't view it in, simply in terms of democracy, goes back well before the French Revolution. And the world before the French Revolution is not an undifferentiated picture of the Ancien Regime. And the Ancien Regime is not an undifferentiated phenomenon. The Ancien Regime means the bourgeois absolutist state in the continent of Europe. It doesn't mean feudalism. Right? The, 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 the French state of the Bourbon monarchy is not pre-modern. But of course, much more fundamentally is the question of the Reformation, the Dutch Revolt, and above all, the British Revolution, which is a revolution that is fundamentally liberal and self-consciously a break with the past. In the name of the rights of labor, it's right there in John Law, the theorist of the revolution that was not mentioned, the Glorious Revolution, of 1688-89, that property derived that 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 property de derives from labor, right? This is a completely modern revolutionary concept. That this is a revolution that is giving rise to a new form of society, is rendering the state adequate to an already emerging form of society, which is theorized well before the American Revolution, well before even Adam Smith, as commercial, as a society rooted in wage labor, which you can see in the Whig theoreticians that the American Revolution is quoting over and over again. Now, it's true what Daniel says that the Americans wanted to return to situation prior to 1763, but that's because after the British victory in the Seven Years' War, the British Revolution is coming into crisis, and that is registered profoundly in Britain itself. In the Wilkesite movement, etc., the American Revolution is not an isolated phenomenon. It is part and parcel of the crisis of the modern revolution occasioned by, guess what, its success, by Britain's victory on four continents in the Seven Years' War, which is, is self-understood by the patriot Whigs of Great Britain, which is where the notion of patriot comes from, as a vindication on the global scale of bourgeois right of the philosophy of, 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 the, of the revolution of John Locke. And so when you look at the, theor the theorization of the crisis of that revolution, and here Adam Smith is the key theorist, he's talking about the crisis of revolution. He calls John Locke a mercantilist. Right? He's saying this revolution, in order to be advanced, has got to be specified in deep. And that's not, again, just a matter of democracy. There's all sorts of dimensions to the question of representation involved in achieving, as it were, the rule of law responsible to society. Parliamentary supremacy. The supremacy of society over the state. So the American revolutionaries are not only wanting to return to the status quo antebellum, to the, to the status quo before the Seven Years' War. They're wanting to return to the revolution that was the Seven Years' War, the defeat of French absolutism in India, in Africa, in Canada, in the Caribbean, in Europe, which is what happened in, from 1756 to 17, 
1963 that set the stage for the Americans. And it's not enough to say that there weren't oppressions in the American Revolution that prompted the revolution. It was a revolution that was very self-consciously about advancing the project of commercial society. The Stamp Act didn't have to drive the Americans into penury. The T Act or the Intolerable Acts didn't have to drive them into penury for them to understand what their British comrades were saying, which is that there's a new oligarchy consolidating itself on the victory of the Seven Years War around George Grenville, around Lord North, in collusion increasingly with George III that is threatening our liberties everywhere. So I think the idea that the American Revolution in 1776 is conservative or ambiguous, no, I think it is what Thomas Paine's pamphlet was that was read all over this country. Said it was. It was a project of, of beginning the world anew, of overcoming the rule of the priests and the aristocrats, advancing the project, if, if you will, the revolt of the Third Estate, which is also at the heart of the French Revolution. The French Revolution is democratic in advancing that liberal project, not in opposition to it. And that's true even of the Jacobins. So that's, that'll be my provocation to both people.
the Bourbon monarchy was a mess. There was a, there was a growing aristocrat, aristocratic reaction in which opportunities for commoners were restricted. Napoleon, for example, was, an, was, was we know, was in an, an artillery school and knew that he would never get a commission because he was not a, a, a had to have a, a full four quarter noble. That, they, that, they, that, that was an expression, it was not a purely noble uh, heritage. And they were tightening up those regulations. And it was this, 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 uh, this aristocratic reaction which drove the revolt of the, uh, of the Third Estate. Now, and, and I agree, by the way, that, you know, that 1689 is the, uh, is the key year here. But 1689 is the essence of a conservative revolution. Yes. One that essentially brought the landed gentry you know, into parliament, established the, the dictatorship of, of parliament and the landed gentry, established a dictatorship of wealth, a highly effective dictatorship, I guess you might say. Um, but nonetheless, that was, the, that was the 1689 revolution. It did establish a commercial uh, financial state in, a, in, a, in Great Britain, the Bank of England was founded in 1694, only, only uh, five years later. Um, and, and the Americans uh, were loyal to that tradition. So I think that 1689 uh, just buttresses my point that essentially it was a conservative revolution, a conservative democracy, which interpreted democracy, the will of the people, in conservative, traditionalist, localist, Jeffersonian terms. Um, so, so therefore, and I think that we are still wrestling with this, we are profoundly oppressed by this conservative legacy to this day, which is locked in place by, by a constitution which is now 235 years old. But I just don't understand why you're really quarreling with my thesis. Anyway, that's it. I really want to open it for Q&A, but I think these remarks are provocative for more discussion. Can we have brief, brief responses from uh, Anthony and Spencer on what Dan just said? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, let's, yeah. You sure? Okay. So I'm going to mobilize my moderating privileges and select myself for the first question. <laughs> <laughs> this will be for Tony. So starting with your departure point, namely you have no desire to reinscribe uh, settler colonialism as it were. And then continuing the American Revolution is where you ended. And so reflecting on Du Bois, he played no small part in 1946, organizing with Paul Robeson and Jessica Simpkins, the quote, Southern Negro Youth Congress. In their internal program, what they had was, we are continuing the legacy of the great Southern statesmen, Washington and Jefferson, right? And so I think the official left today oftentimes conflates settler colonialism with the American Re Revolution. You appear to disarticulate the two. Can you say more about that? Well, first of all, uh, settler colonialism as a theory of concept is so vague mm -hmm. that it means everything to everybody uh, and pretty much nothing. Uh, First, and I, I, I consider it to be a counter-revolutionary theory in a time when uh, it doesn't take much imagination to see that the American people are objectively in rebellion against their government. Um, every poll points this out. Uh, but settler colonialism the quotes, privileges, the struggle for race, race struggle over the class struggle, and sees no way even that the two can dialectically interact. In other words, either it's race or it's class. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I find it to be a counter-revolutionary theory. Uh, it is a theory uh, that says that, well, the working class can never be united uh, because white workers are uh, have encoded into their DNA a uh, sense of uh, racial privilege, uh, which we see evaporating all around us. 
Uh, and in fact, uh, the advocates of settler colonialism, the 1619 Project, and we can go down the line, are uh, hostile to the working class itself and working class unity. Uh, now, as to what constitutes a revolution, if Martin Luther King is not a revolutionary, then who is? I'd like to know what the definition of revolution is in this country. I'm not talking about anywhere else, the United States, which, and I'm not an advocate of American exceptionalism, but I am an advocate of American specificity. And that logics of social revolution have to be specific to the histories of those countries. Uh, I think I answered the question. Thank you, Tony. Yes. I saw some hands. Okay. Thank you. I'm point that that is what made my hands shoot up. Um, okay, uh, Marxists, uh, appearance, essence, uh, you know, what we see and what actually is, um, amplifying what uh, uh, Tony Montero just said. Uh, Martin Luther King, in the context, the specific context of uh, the United States, uh, motivated what he characterized, and I, I don't disagree really, as the fourth American revolution, in the context of politics, uh, social movements, uh, marketing, and everything else of the United States. In the same way that Lenin, the revolutionary, and I don't think anyone would challenge his credentials on that score, saw that wedding bread, peace, and land together meant pe three different groups of people lined up and marched behind you on the way to your revolution. King was using the language of the people of the United States to motivate them in the material world to do actual things without worrying about how this sounded to some third party, judging it on a pseudo-ideological measurement. He was trying to actually make revolution by saying the things, if I were to use some religious language, knowing that calling everyone out into the street for Jesus to overthrow capitalism would actually do it. Am I a revolutionary if I achieve that? That to me is what King was. Response? All right, okay. Uh, well, well uh, no, I don't agree. Words are matter. Rhetoric matters. Uh, if, King, if King defends, you know, invokes the Supreme Court, the same institution which is now oppressing us now, that's a, that's a problem. But we've got to unravel. If King, you know, if King, if King invokes the Constitution, uh, that is a problem. Lenin never used language like that. Lenin never invoked traditional Russian values in defense of the revolution. Lenin was, was, a, was a modernist who used the most modern language and was absolutely ruthless in in uh, in, in in rejecting anything that struck that, that struck him as an example of Russian traditionalism, Russian traditional rhetoric. He recruited the peasantry. But they did it on, on <laughs> modern terms, on Bolshevik terms, not, not, any, not, not on populist terms. Uh, he actually recruited them on the terms that motivated them, and that was not Marxism. That was land. Lenin was not an opportunist. Lenin was a Marxist. That's not he was the greatest Marxist of our, of our era. That's science. That's not opportunism. Next if, question. If you, <laughs> sorry. I, I, see, I see what the difference is between our perspective is. Um, first of all, um, let me just say that um, my, my unmitigated liberal anti-Trumpism notwithstanding how much I enjoyed and learned from all three uh, presentations, I thought, that, I thought that, was, that was really brilliant. Um, yes. And I wanted to ask sort of, um, Anthony sort of started off um, critiquing uh, contemporary historians for forgetting about the logic of history. And I took that as, well, as being a criticism of historians for abandoning a philosophy of history. I think you're right. I would agree with that. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think we, then we learned from Platypus that the philosophy of history that we should be uh, turning to is Marxism. And um, I want to ask whether, to what extent, um, Anthony, one of Anthony's um, Last um, remarks about the uh, about the needing need for national specificity um, 
whether to what extent the specific aspects of the American experience require a dilution, a transformation, a mutation, a deepening, or whatever of Marxism as a philosophy of history. Well, yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, I guess you must have been living within my head for the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, science did not end with the Russian Revolution, nor did it end with dust capital, uh, as great as all of this was. And we are on, I think, in this ideological and political moment, uh, which might portend a great revolution of course, it could be the opposite. I think it's leaning towards a great revolutionary change. And by revol I think we're going to have to define this word revolution. And I, I agree with Don DeBar here. We're not talking about a sectarian project that only a few intellectuals understand. We're, we're talking about something where masses of people engage themselves in changing the system. I think that a great synthesis of scientific projects is called for at this time. And I speak of it in terms of a synthesis of Lenin and Du Bois. Of course, it involves more than that. I think with Lenin it is more specific because he is the Russian Revolution, if we really tell the truth about it. The great theorist of the Russian Revolution. Without him, there is none. But then there is Du Bois. And Du Bois is a great summation of much of American history, both the democratic and anti-slavery, radical revolutionary democratic traditions. And we have all of those traditions. So I would agree with you. I think otherwise we are condemning ourselves to political and intellectual laziness uh, and sectarianism. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. you know, I can respond to that. Actually, I want to respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, does the American experience require a transformation of Marxism? Yeah, that's the, that's the question. Yeah, I think that the task of Marxism is to lead the American Revolution, or it's not. I I spoke about Lenin as battling with, struggling with Woodrow Wilson for the leadership of the American Revolution, and that's because if the if Marxism or socialism is opposed to the ideals of the American Revolution, it will be doomed. It will be doomed with the American people, and it will be doomed with the world. It w if you try to retreat below the threshold of the American Revolution in favor of collectivism or something else, if you try to retreat from the question of you know, the deeply liberal sentiment that the freedom of each is the precondition for the freedom of all, which is not a socialist principle, it's a liberal principle. It's, an, it's truly an American principle. Then the revolution is doomed. Socialism is doomed. Marxism has no purpose whatsoever. So I would say for Marxism to become itself it has to lead the American Revolution. It doesn't have to modify itself in the sense of retreating from anything that was developed in the European Revolution. But the, as it were, conquest of the American Revolution is the highest mountain to climb. And it is tantamount, I think, even today, even for all the talk about new hegemons in the world and decline of America, I think that Marxism's leading of the American Revolution is tantamount to speaking of world socialist revolution. Right, so I would, I would put it in 
in those terms. Um, I have anything to say about Martin Luther King, but that's not the question, so I'll, I'll pass it on later. <laughs> right. um, uh, Martin Luther King well, I, I just want to say that, that, that I agree. I think Anthony makes some very important points about settler colonialism. Settler colonialism. In fact, I agree with you, I do too. and I agree also with your uh, your statement of the slave proletariat as being the proud, the, the founding, uh, uh, the, the the founder, the the the, the, the fundament of the uh, yeah. the later American. Can proletariat. I just say the ground? The groundwork. Yeah, if that, if that yeah, I don't uh, forgive me. No, that's, that's, that's totally fine. But I, I agree with that totally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you asked, what is a revolution? Um, uh, I think that I would sort of answer those in, in, in two ways. Uh, uh, legally or constitutionally, a revolution is a break. Um, it's a rupture in the in the in the, the constitutional continuum where a new sovereign, a new sovereign authority is installed in a way which goes contrary to the pre-existing constitutional arrangement. Uh, Lincoln was a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And the reason he was a revolutionary, and he was, was, he was a revolutionary because his policies were a repudiation of the American Revolution. Lincoln was forced to take actions that essentially were contrary to the, the original revolutionary tradition. And the South, by the way, as much as, as, as hard as it is to admit, was in many ways marked the continuation of that 1776 tradition. But Lincoln broke with it to the same extent that the Jacobins broke with the Girondins. In, a, in France, and, and, and essentially repudiated the, the previous exile, a constant of revolution, imposed a new one, which was in many ways opposite. And I think that we have got to subject the American Revolution to the most ruthless critique. We've got to blow it up. And by the way, what I'm saying is contrary to what, what Lenin said in his famous letter to American workers, where he actually endorsed the American Revolution. So I'm making a, an anti Leninist argument, but I would argue it's really. It's, it's more Leninist than that. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but our job is ruthlessly critique the, the American Revolution to explode it in the same way that the, the Jacobins exploded the Girondin Revolution um, and, to, and to turn it into its opposite, which is a really a modernist, a modernist modernizing small d democratic revolution, which essentially uh, uh, would uh, be fulfilled by the accession to power of the proletariat, the international proletariat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for your comments, and I find very useful some of the other comments that have been made. Uh, for me, it's very difficult to come to an understanding of some of the things that you have introduced without first, without starting with the social and class forces that have been involved throughout this entire period. If we don't do that, it's impossible to, to come to an appreciation of what it is. Starting from the first American Revolution, you know, the, the products of it, the conquests that were made, the Canadian classes that were involved, the conquests that were made in protections and freedoms against, protections against the state, which has very much relevance today. Those are some of the things that, and the freedoms, for the, for the working masses to find a space to continue to act. You know, like these are not things, these are not passive things. These are things that continue to be enriched and renewed in the course of the struggle. You know, like, and the relevance today, which I think some of you have alluded to it, you know, like in which a lot of those freedoms and protections are, well, they have always been, but there has been, I think, an increase. And I think Montero alluded to that a little bit. You know, it's like on, on how the, the offensive against these constitutional protections and freedoms today being uh, waged primarily you know, like by those on the left, the Biden administration leading on some of those questions, including the prettying up of the FBI, the role of the FBI. You know, it's like, and we, should never re we should never forget that when the ruling class uses its institutions against one of their opponents, 
what they will do to us, especially when it's, what they will do to us, you know, like, anyway, don't, don't recognize that at your own peril. Uh, but I, I think that there are very, very concrete things at stake here in this discussion. Very concrete states uh, in this discussion, uh, including how you know it's like we have left the banner to the conservative capitalist bourgeoisie to be the defenders of you know, constitutional protections and, and and freedoms. Freedom becomes synonym synonym of right wing politics, but it's not. You know, it's like it's the it's the working class that has big stakes in the defense of this. So a lot of these questions that you that, that you have touched on, yeah, you know, very, very useful uh, historical stuff and things like that. But I think some of the things that, that, that you've also touched that concretely brings it down, brings it to the stakes today are, are very important to, to touch on a little bit more. Can I just say something? You know, uh, I agree with you, this is a very high stakes game at this point. Uh, probably more high stakes than it's been in many, many decades in this country. And I agree with you, in such a high stakes game, philosophy and theory are more important than ever. You know, we could have gotten by in previous times with less theoretical clarity. That's why. I said, and you know, for me, it makes all the sense in the world. We have to understand something about the philosophy or logic of American history. Uh, I find that many of us know more about European history than the actualities of American history, which means whether we know it or not, that in not knowing our own history means that we do not know our own working class. And if we don't know our own working class, talk of revolution is empty. And that, that's the point that I would make. Uh, I could be wrong, I, I, you know, right or wrong on this debate. We are in a high stakes game. In such a game, and, and I would disagree with Spencer, if I understand what he's saying, that the question is not whether Marxism is proven right at this time. Right, right. And I agree that America is the, is the test of the possibility of modern revolution. We are at the center of this. I think what is at stake, and I think this comes out of what Spencer said, is humanity itself. We do this or the consequences for not just our nation and our people, but for humanity are dire. It's a do or die situation. That's why I you know I asked the question, what do we mean revolution? If Link if Lincoln is a revolution, revolutionist, why is it Martin Luther King? Uh, why is not, and I'll, I'll shut up, why is not the questions put on the agenda, the remaking of a people, the logic of a class in formation coming to a class for itself, but its origins, its logical origins, in the enslaved proletariat. What would that mean? And I think it would mean a great deal if workers fighting to organize unions at Starbucks and other places, leaders of trade unions, but leaders of communities, of masses of people saw themselves and their history in a different way, in a way of be in a way of becoming, rather than a way of looking at our history as something of the past, but looking at our history as something for the future. 
Can I just add something yeah. to that, please? Um, about this question of history and and the logic of history, I think it's important to understand that the logic of history is a product of history. Um, that, Explain. That the American Revolution is itself producing a logic. Okay. Right? It's not just a function of that logic, it's actually bringing historic logic into being a logic of, of freedom. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, about this question of Marxism leading the American Revolution, one of my remarks that <coughs> we're trying to get at is the contradiction between a constitutional republic or liberalism in that sense, because America's republicanism isn't a break with liberal monarchism, actually. Right? It's Montesquieu in that sense. Uh, it's a realization of what Montesquieu called monarchy. People like James Madison understood these things very well. Um, it's, it's liberal and democratic. And those two things are contradictory. Democracy is at war with our, not only the Bill of Rights, but it's at war with the idea of the self-regulation of society. You can see this in the muzzling of doctors. Not, doctors don't determine the care of their patients today. We want a world in which the guild of medical professionals determine the protocols of care, not democracy. Right? We want a world in which teachers determine the protocols of education, right? not democracy. There's all sorts of ways in which society regulates itself that are not functions of universal suffrage democracy. Right? And but that is just a severe you just, you just qualified it and said universal suffrage democracy. Mass democracy, capitalist democracy. Okay, but right. Okay. I don't think that liberal democracy is inherently contradictory. Right. I think it's contradictory, and this is to the point of why Marxism. It's contradictory under conditions of capital. Right. So the question is, how do we address the state? I think the the questioner in the back said, "Look, the Democrats are mobilizing the." capital state repressive apparatus against their political enemies, and they're sure to do that again. And of course, they, you know, even in their own primary, right, all the Sanders supporters were saying they stole the election, mm -hmm. right? They stole the primary. Didn't we win in Iowa? What was that funny app that they were using? What are you talking about, Blue Judge won? Right, and then it gets revised later, right? Um, obviously, um, these people are, you know, their, their hypocrisy, their cynicism is, is shockingly evident. It's shockingly evident. The, the will to manipulation on the part of Democrats today, like the desire to be hoodwinked, the desire to be lied to, the desire to abandon your own reason is, truly depressing. And what the conservatives say is true. Everything that they say about their political enemies, they do. Everything that they say, right? Uh, that's true. Um, so the question is, how are we gonna deal with the contradiction between democracy, democracy as the basis of the imperialist or the Bonapartist state, and liberalism. Even if Marxism's gone, even if Marxism's dead, and by the way, it is. <laughs> right? It's been gone for a real long time in the real world. Right? Socialism's been gone for a real long time in the real world. Right? But we're still dealing with the unmastered revolution under conditions of capital. Right? 
And to me, the only resources that we have are this old, dead, betrayed tradition mm -hmm. that, you know, as soon as you find someone else who upholds it, you find, you know, that they're a Democrat and they're a liar. <laughs> right? um, but we still have to claim it. Right? That's what I meant. Um, as for conservative, and, and, and I just want to say something about Lincoln. Lincoln is expressing the way that the American Revolution is found up in contradiction. He is a Bonapartist in the service of the Constitution. Right? Yes, he's violating habeas corpus. He's rounding up enemies of the regime without due process of law. He's a tyrant and a warmonger. He's burning down the cities of his country, for God's sake, in the service of the preservation of the Union. Right? These are, you know, it, and I will say that at that moment, international socialism is born. The flag at the first meeting of the first international is the American flag. Right. So this question of like um, the, the relationship of the, revolu of, of the modern revolution to Marxism is itself a Marxist self-understanding. It's there when Marx claims 1776. It's there when he congratulates the American people on the re-election of Abraham Lincoln. And it's there in Lenin's letter to the American people on, in, the, you know, in the direct way of the seizure of power in Russia. <coughs> a, a quick response. Um, first of all, I think it's really wrong to describe uh, the modern bourgeoisie as democratic. I mean, to say that what, what we're seeing now, that, that, that democracy is, the, is somehow an instrument in the hands of the imperialist state is standing in reality on the America, the whole world is moving in an increasingly anti-democratic direction uh, at the, in order to preserve capitalism. And preserving capitalism requires the destruction of democracy. So we have got to defend democracy against capitalism. But that means essentially subjecting our own institutions to the most withering critique, including the Supreme Court, the Senate, based on equal state representation, an outrageously racist body, uh, the, the Electoral College, et cetera, et cetera. So it's wrong to equate democracy with, the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with capitalism. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, about, uh, well, I guess I can't leave it there, but I'm going to go to one. Okay, um, so my question is actually about democracy, and I'd like just to maybe mark that it seems as though a recurring theme on this panel thus far has been that in order to understand what revolution is or what it might be, we need to look at the revolutions of the past and take the revolutions of the past as kind of a basis for our understanding of revolution now, whether it be Dan looking to the French Revolution, Tony, you looking to the various American revolutions, um, or looking also to 1917 and Lenin. Um, and so I have maybe two questions, because I have to just, I just have to ask one thing, I'm sorry, that um, isn't my general question. So the first, that, but that I think are based on kind of trying to look at these revolutions in the past and understand them and think about them. And Dan, you said that the South was more of a continuation of the Constitution and the American Revolution than the, than the North. And I just want to pose this question to you, which is that in the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln said that we're fighting so that government upformed by the people may not perish from this earth. In the famous or infamous cornerstone speech of the Confederacy, and I don't even remember who gives this. Alexander Stevens. Thank you, Alexander Stevens. He says something to the effect that the Constitution of the Founding Fathers secretly all along was going to rot the base of our wonderful Southern society based on slavery. 
and we have to toss it out. We can't have these freedoms that they said we could have because it creates all of these problems. And we're going to solve the labor problem in the South by having slavery. And that's how we're going to avoid the socialism of Europe and all of these problems that they have in the North. And so however you want to um, consider theoretically for yourself the Civil War, I do think we have to contend with why is it that that's the way that these two sides thought of themselves as contesting the American Revolution. Why is that the case? And then my other question, which is really about democracy. Um, of the revolutions that have been mentioned in this panel, right, the American Revolution of 1776, um, the French Revolution, but then later, later revolutions like 1848 or 1917, the American Revolution really wasn't about democracy or universal suffrage and neither really was the French Revolution, they seem to be about a different type of civil freedom, right? Um, Lenin, in State and Revolution, um, kind of talking about Engels, said that the revolution, uh, the socialist revolution will appear first as the demand for democracy. And that nevertheless, democracy is still a state, and so it is thus not free. It's also a form of coercion. So I want to ask this question, why is it that the revolution appears as a demand for democracy. Why is that the case? Um, and I think related to that, why is it that then liberalism and the American Revolution seems to be an adequate or necessary criticism um, of that demand for democracy? And I think bound up with this is a whole slew of ex historical experience. I mean, I'm thinking here too of the fact that it seems to me that the new left in the 60s generation really feels the need to be kind of against the American Revolution um, and for democracy. And I think that might be an example of this, just to make it more concrete. But yeah, why is it that um, the revolution appears as the demand for democracy? And, and uh, who are you addressing the questions to? Uh, that one's to everybody. Okay. And the, the first one's to me, though? Yeah, that's for you. So like that, the, the question is, uh, is uh, why did this um, why is it that the Confederacy feels that they're against the American Re yeah. Revolution and the Union feels that they're for the American Revolution? Well, it's very, it's very complex. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tricky question. And American politics are, supp are surprisingly paradoxical. Um, they, they, aren't such, they, they aren't always easy, easy to understand. But remember that the, the, uh, the, the, the revolution wound up, the revolution had a dual effect on slavery. Uh, half the states wound up, you know, as a consequence of the revolutionary process, wound up instituting anti-slavery legislation. The other half wound up strengthening slavery with the uh, with the support of the, of the Constitution. So it was this dual heritage, and, and essentially, the, the Civil War was was born in 1776. Because once the two sections started heading off in a different direction, it was inevitable. They, they would have to come to blows. Um, the uh, Lincoln, you know, I mean, Lincoln, you know, utilized constitutional language, but you no, know, a government of, of, by, and for the people exists nowhere in the Constitution. The Constitution is very, is very ambiguous on the, on the democracy issue. Nowhere does it mention the D word. Uh, um, and in fact, the logic of the Constitution is to essentially try to restrain, you know, uh, majorities, which Madison saw as being threatening to good sense and, and, and economic prerogatives of the different regions, which meant the slaveholders' prerogatives to hold, you know, millions of people in chains, or hundreds of thousands of times. Um, so, no, so the, um, so, so the, the, the heritage was complex. Neither side was fully honest. Lincoln was not fully honest. And in the end, the northern bourgeoisie had to change the Constitution. Even though they insisted in 1861 the Constitution was on their side, when they adopted, adopted the three post-Civil War amendments, was a admission the Constitution had not been on their side. And they had to make damn sure it would be on their side uh, henceforth. Anyway, that's out of my focus. Anyway, God. Yeah. Um, it, it, I disagree strongly with the American historian. <laughs> that the American historian. Okay. That 
The immediate consequence of the revolution of 1776 is a strengthening of slavery in the southern states. I, do, I, I think that the wave of evolution that the revolution unleashed extended profoundly throughout the union of, of states that emerged in the 18th century and on into the early 19th century. There, the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut and in New York also transformed the institution of slavery in Maryland and in Virginia and even in the Carolinas and Georgia. It, the Civil War is not baked into 1776. There is, in this, I don't know how Tony would relate to this, uh, but there is a proletarianization of slavery. There's a transformation of slavery under the conditions of the Industrial Revolution. And the Confederacy is a project of rejoining the British Empire. You know, it's really of bringing the entirety of North America back under the control of the European empires. It's a project of, of, of course, they overthrow the government of Mexico. Uh, the Emperor uh, Louis Napoleon does. Uh, they're reinstituting uh, European colonialism in the Caribbean in the 1860s. And the Confederacy's victory would mean victory in New York City and in Boston and in Philadelphia. It would never be confined to the southern states. It would mean the counter-revolutionary overthrow of the revolution of 1776. It's exactly what Marx understands it, and I think he's right about that. Right? The struggle is not for secession. Secession is just a blind. The struggle is to overthrow the revolution. Now, why does the revolution appear as the demand for democracy? It doesn't until capitalism. Right? There is a liberal critique of democracy that Daniel raises as conservative, that is not conservative, that is liberal. There is a critique of mob rule. There is a critique of democracy from the theoreticians of the 17th and 18th century, and they are, it's not conservative. Because it is a argument that there are many people in society who are dependent upon elites that will serve as, the, as it were, fodder for anti, um, for illiberal movements, like the Church and King riots, like the Gordon riots, that took place in England in the 1780s and 90s, right? The critique, and, and we all have this critique, right? You hear it all the time. The argument against the deplorables is liberal common sense. Why are these illiterate, uneducated, rubes, and rustics, and rednecks allowed to participate in the collective project of government? Or why are these slip tarts allowed to participate in the collective project of government? Right? People hate democracy. They hate it. All the time you hear the hatred of democracy. I mean, seriously. But you hate the other people. They steer, they stir it up. Capitalist politicians stir this up, and they hear Tony strongly arguing against, from a socialist perspective, for falling for that crap. Now, capitalism produces. I am. You, I say that you're arguing against capitalist politicians dividing. Oh, the yes, so far, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry if I wasn't you know, articulating very well. Um, Capitalism produces a society in which many of us have no ability to participate in that society. And in fact, all of us are threatened with blacklisting, cancellation, and persecution, socially. Right? 
it is our, our ability to participate in civil liberty, most fundamentally through labor. We are all threatened with the loss of our job, and that takes the form of an enforcement of conformity. Right? It is not just that you need to do your job and do it well, but you also need to not rock the boat and not say the wrong thing and your opinion should be dictated and your appearance, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's a deep authoritarianism welling up from capitalism because we're all threatened with cancellation all the time. Before the word cancel culture existed, the threat of unemployment existed, right? And in that context, the only claim that any of us might have is political. As capitalist industrialization emerges, you get the demand for universal suffrage democracy. Because people may have no other claim on society than their vote. And they will demand that democracy give them a job. They will demand that democracy address the crisis of capitalism. Democracy does address the crisis of capitalism. Right now, it addresses it in the form of the Bonapartist state, which is extremely brutal and unforgiving, etc. But it does meet the otherwise unmet necessity for socialism. It addresses, in that sense, the contradictions of capitalism through things like prisons and welfare, cops, etc. That's what those things are capitalist expressions. Those are not democratic. They are not democratic. They, no, they are democratic. No, they're not democratic. They're, they're, they're anti democratic. Prison, mass imprisonment <coughs> is anti democratic. The Supreme Court is the welfare state. The is, Senate is, is anti democratic. How is this an expression of democracy? It's precisely the opposite. Because Putting a million people in prison <coughs> is a is a gross the welfare state, of democracy. The welfare state, no less than prisons, is an expression of capitalism and demanded by democracy. I'm not saying that there are other ways that democracy can handle those contradictions, but they are all one capital state project. And behind the welfare state is the cops. Can I ask you a question, By the way. Spencer? Yeah. Are you an anarchist? I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to know. I'm, I'm an anarchist yeah, because, I'm a yeah, no, because I'm a liberal. Okay, well, right? yeah, Liberalism <laughs> demanded <laughs> the end of the state. Right? The American Revolution in 1776 demanded the subordination of the state to society. Right? All that anarchism is, is the memory of liberalism's demand for the subordination of the state to society. Right? Marxism is an argument that in order to abolish the state, the working class has to take power. Right? It just, in that sense, Marxism is, a, is, as it were, an imminent critique of the anarchistic memory and preservation of liberalism. Okay, that's a very interesting force. <laughs> right? But the, the revolution is a demand for democracy to bring about the end of the state, yeah. to bring about the end of democracy. Okay, so, so we're going to take one more question, and I'm going to ask that our panelists fold any of their closing remarks into their responses. So I'm going to Yeah. Is this on? Yes. yes. So I'm pretty much just asking Dan about this. I'm very interested in uh, you know, your argument here about the American Revolution. It makes a lot of sense to me from just what I've you know, read. But um, and I do have like one question, which is like, how does Tom Paine fit into this whole idea of like, you know, the conservative democracy and the American Revolution as this kind of um, conservative, like looking back to like, you know, the liberty of the ancients and stuff. So, so how, you know, because you read Tom Paine today, it's, it's you, would, you would imagine that he would see the existing American state as not democratic. Like the ideas there 
go beyond the, um, you know, the kind of constitutional anti-democratic results of the American Revolution. And you, know, you mentioned that it was really not until the Civil War that the kind of Jacobin element comes through. So but, but would you say maybe that Tom Paine and maybe his ideas are kind of like a proto-Jacobin winning? How does that fit into but, your narrative? No, I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, Paine's really interesting. I mean, and he, uh, he, does, he does at one point blame George III for inciting slave rebellions uh, in America. Um, I, mean, I, I, mean, I mean, Paine was a very radical figure in America. In France, he was a moderate Girondin, okay? Who nearly got his head chopped off if someone hadn't hadn't marked the door incorrectly, he would have been, uh, he would have been guillotined. Uh, he, uh, he voted against the, uh, the execution of uh, Louis XVI, which I, which I think was a, a, a very important, profoundly necessary step the revolution had to take. Um, and, and, but nonetheless, even his moderate Girondism was too much to the Americans, because when he came back to America, 1799 was it, I think, uh, he, was, uh, he was essentially ostracized. Because it was anti, his, 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 uh, his free thinking, anti religious uh, uh, sentiments. So I mean, he's, a, he's, he's a person who, you know, who shows the, the essential conservatism of the American Revolution. Uh, you know, he's, he's a very admirable guy. He's a great writer. I think in some ways, I mean, as a prose stylist, he was really quite revolutionary. He really sort of kind of invented plain speaking prose. Right. But, uh, but um, uh, he's a. Um, uh, you know, he's a very interesting figure, but a very, you know, ambiguous figure. Okay. Round of applause for our panelists, please. Yeah, yeah. Our next panel is being pushed back about 30 minutes. We'll be starting at 4. It is, what is a political party for the left? Critical question. I encourage all of you to attend. We're going to be right across the way here in Star Foundation Hall. Hope to see you then. Thank you.